everyone and welcome to Miss Estric Biology and in this video I'm going to be talking you through how you can get full marks on the long answer questions in A-level biology. Now these long answer questions, for example like the five mark questions where it's just describe everything you know about a particular topic, these can really divide the crowd. People either love them or hate them. Now I personally love them. I think those are one of the easiest ways that you can get full marks on a question and bump up your grade and I'm going to be talking you through in this video how you can follow three steps to help you to get full marks on these questions. Now make sure you stick around at the end because I'm going to be modeling these three key steps on three past paper questions that you can have a go at with me to see when you implement these steps do you now get full marks. But for now let's get into it. Step number one is bullet point your answer. So I'm going to put that as a bullet point of course. Now the advantage of doing bullet points for your answers is, first of all, it's going to be so much quicker to bullet point what you need rather than writing long lengthy paragraphs. So it's going to be quicker. Number two, it's going to be easier for you to check your answer at the end because you can have a look through the bullet points, check if you've got a key marking point in each bullet point. So you're more likely to be able to check your answers and improve them if you need to. And also it makes it easier for the examiner to mark. And if it's easier for them to mark, they are less likely to make a mistake. So bullet pointing your answers is going to make you write a higher quality answer because you shouldn't be waffling. It'll be easier for you to check. It'll be easy for you to check you've got key marking points in each bullet point and it means the examiner is less likely to make a mistake. So that's number one, bullet point your answer. Now just link to that one. For AQA you can bullet point your answer for every single question except for the essay. For other exam boards, you do get marked on your quality of written communication or QWC. So you do need to double check with your specification on the long answer questions. Does it say QWC or quality of written communication has been assessed? Because if it does say that, you cannot bullet point your answers. So that's one just to double check. Number two is giving yourself an insurance bullet point. So let's get that down as our next one. Of course we're bullet pointing these points. So insurance bullet points. Now what I mean by an insurance bullet point is, if it's a five mark question, do six bullet points. So you've got one extra as an insurance. Because what you might find is, maybe two of the bullet points you wrote were actually worth one mark and you needed to say both of those things to get one mark. And now you've actually only got four points instead of five. So always do one extra than the question is worth as an insurance in case two of them were a combined mark or just in case one of them wasn't worth a mark. So cover your back by doing one extra. And then number three is underlining key marking points. So we need to underline key points. So for all five of your bullet points, or six if it's a five mark question, go through them and underline what you think is the key word, the key phrase that you would have to say to get the mark. The benefit of this is it makes you check have you definitely got a key marking point in every bullet point? And it makes it easier for you to check when you're going through. And again, it makes it so much easier for the examiner. And if it's easier for them, they're less likely to make a mistake. So it's yet another tip of how you can improve the quality of your answer in the first place. But then also, if you have time to check through at the end, it means you'll be able to check through quicker and hopefully do better checks and improvements. So now the bit that I said hang around for the end for, I'm going to be going through three five mark questions. So grab yourself a pen and paper, join in with me, and I'm going to be doing it on the whiteboard. Let's go. It's five marks, that means we're going to aim for six bullet points. It doesn't actually specify if it wants the nucleotide or the overall polymer structure, so I'm going to talk about both. So the first thing I'm actually going to point out is DNA is a polymer. And that's one of the key marking points I'm going to underline, the polymer. Uh, I'm going to say made up of nucleotide monomers. So that's my key marking point. I'm going to describe that nucleotide next. So it's made up of a phosphate group. That's the key marking point, or at least I assume. And um, deoxyribose and nitrogenous bases. So, so far then I've said it's a polymer, nucleotides are the monomers, and those are the components of the nucleotide. Next then, I'm going to talk about the um, polymer structure. So I'm going to say double helix, and I'm going to put in brackets two strands. Uh, I'm going to say two strands held by hydrogen bonds. 
I also haven't talked about yet in the polymer that um, phosphodiester bonds. I'm going to put that in as well. So I actually haven't highlighted here. So hydrogen bonds, double helix, and um, phosphodiester bonds. I'm going to say between adjacent nucleotides, phosphodiester bonds. Right, so we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. I've got six bullet points there. I've got my one extra as an insurance. One extra thing I'm going to add in, I think, is where I've talked about the two strands. I think I'm gonna add about the complementary base pairs. So I'm gonna to have to duck down here now to get to the bottom of my board. Um, so let's have complementary base pairs. So we have cytosine and guanine, adenine and thymine, because really we should be naming those bases somewhere within this question. Thymine. Okay, so there we have it. We've got five marks for that five mark question. So if you had a go at this question, let's now mark it to see what you would have got the marks for. Okay, so there was one mark for saying DNA is a polymer. So there's mark, there's mark number one. There was another mark for talking about what the nucleotides were made up of. So there is a second mark. There was another mark for saying the double helix is held by hydrogen bonds. So those two bullet points were worth one mark, which is why it's always worth giving extra bullet points than you think. There was a mark for talking about phosphodiester bonds. And then the final mark was for stating all of these complementary base pairs and which go together. So one, two, three, four, five marks. Have a go at marking yours and see how you did. And let's go on to the next one. Okay, so question number two is state. We've got to state and describe the five ways that substances transport across the membrane. So I think I'm actually start by separating out, just stating the five ways, and then we'll fill in the descriptions afterwards. So I'm going to start with simple diffusion. I'll leave a gap, but not too big actually, because there's not a lot to say for simple diffusion. So then facilitated diffusion, we'll need osmosis, active transport, and co-transport. So for this one, I don't know how much scope there's gonna be for an insurance because those are the five types of transport for AQA. Other exam boards, you have exocytosis and endocytosis. So if you were doing um, NXL or OCR, then that could be an extra one on this one. Um, but for this AQA, we'll go through these five and we'll add in the description. So that is the method. Description, I'm just gonna say for this is down the concentration gradient. But I'm also going to point out what kind of molecule that could be. So I'm going to say small molecules. So small, if it's going through a membrane, it would have to be non-polar as well. So small, non-polar. Next then, facilitated diffusion. That's still down a concentration gradient. Down a concentration gradient. Um, it has to go through either a carrier or a channel protein. So I'm going to say through carrier slash channel protein. Next then, we get to osmosis. So I'm going to say movement of water and it's down the water potential gradient. You could add through a partially permeable membrane, but that doesn't seem to come up much on the mark scheme for A-level, that's more GCSE. Then we get to active transport. So for this one, um, against the concentration gradient, we will say uses ATP for energy, and it's always a carrier protein. So, and we'd have a carrier protein. And then lastly, that takes us to co-transport. So co-transport is movement of two substances. That's why it's co, because it's two substances via a co-transporter protein. Okay, so we've got simple diffusion to underline, facilitated diffusion to underline, osmosis, active transport, co-transport. Those would be the key ideas that I'd be underlining. We've got five points to meet the five ways and we've got our descriptions as well. So for that one, let's mark it. So having a look at the mark scheme, it was literally these answers. So you had to state them and for the description, they did want down a concentration gradient. You did actually also have to state for small non-polar molecules for that mark. Facilitated diffusion, they wanted down a concentration gradient and you could say either of those. Osmosis, you didn't have to say across a partially permeable membrane. You just needed movement of water down the water potential gradient. Active transport against the concentration gradient with ATP through a carrier protein. Co-transport, the idea that it's two substances transporting through either you could say a carrier protein or I said a co-transporter protein. So those are the five marks 
marks. Hopefully you got five marks on it. And let's go on to our final question. Okay, here is our final question. We've got, describe how amino acids in a protein determine the final 3D shape of that protein. So five marks, we're going for six bullet points though. So we've got one insurance and underlining the key terms. So how the amino acids in a protein determine the final 3D shape. Have a go, I'm gonna go through it as well. So I'm gonna start by talking about the different structures. So I'm gonna go for primary structure. Primary structure is sequence of amino acids. The primary structure and the sequence would be the key things to include for that bit of the answer. Then secondary structure is alpha helix slash beta pleated sheets held by hydrogen bonds. Then tertiary structure forms ionic slash disulfide bonds. But I'm gonna say that is, so linking onto here, that's determined by location and interaction of our groups. Then the next mark I'd go for link to this would be determined by location and interactions of those R groups in amino acids. Oh, I mean, no, acids, meaning like it depends on the location in the sequence. And also it's the R groups that interact to form those ionic and disulfide bonds. So we've got one, two, three, four. Uh, and then the next thing I'll say is location of bonds determines the folding. Location of bonds determines folding for that unique 3D shape. One, two, three, four, five. It's throwing a bonus one because it's proteins and it's talking about unique 3D shapes. Let's talk about active sites. Um, so for example, the active sites in an enzyme. So hopefully you had a go at that one. I'm now gonna go at marking it with you. So if we underline the key points, we've got tertiary structure, and the bonds, location and interaction of R groups and amino acids, location determines folding, and I'm gonna go for active site as well. So that's probably the key things that I'd underline. If we have a look on the mark scheme, there was one for describing the primary structure like that. There was another for the secondary structure description. There was one for the tertiary structure as well. This was actually, I think, two separate marks. because There was one about determined by the interactions of the R groups and the interactions in terms of the location and then there was one for this bit down here. So one, two, three, four, five, six. On the mark scheme, they even accepted you talk about the quaternary structure, saying if you had more than one polypeptide chain, that's gonna give a slightly different unique 3D shape as well. So there we have it. Put those three steps to the test like we just did here, and hopefully you'll see that with improved technique, you'll start to get full marks on those questions. Now, yes, obviously you need to know all the information in the first place to be able to do this, but if you have a go at watching some of my complete topic videos, which I'll link at the end, then that will help you with that side as well. But for now, I hope you found that helpful and I'll see you next week.